You are listening to the Real Faith Stories podcast, interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guest and hear their story. Dr. Rob Kelly, welcome to Real Faith Stories. It's an honor to have you on the program. Really looking forward to hearing your story today. Oh, definitely the honor's all mine. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's going to be awesome, guys. Yes, it is. Well, you had a miraculous encounter with the living God through some harrowing experiences. Before we go there, could you please share your backstory about where you grew up and the trajectory of your life, and then when literally the wheels just fell off your life, and what happened after that? Well, as you can tell by my accent, I'm from East Texas. Exactly. <laughs> I'm from uh, Manchester, United Kingdom, grew up there. Lower, lower class, working class family, lots of love in the house, a little bit of trauma, which I didn't realize till I started studying childhood trauma. Not much money about, could never go on trips to, with school, little outings where we camp in a field. My mom and dad couldn't afford that. So I was always the kid with another kid that was left waving the bus off. We call that childhood abandonment today, by the way, but we'll get into that later. I always felt as if I wasn't good enough, but I was a musician. I was on stage at the age of nine years old playing with my musical family, so I could always hide behind my guitar. Mm. And that seemed to be the case. So, you know, not a lot of, not a lot of activities, but I did have this guitar that my mom and dad went into debt with my uncle to buy me. It was 29 pounds at the time, all in years ago. And I found a different side to me, really. I, once I hide behind this guitar, I was good. Otherwise, I was very shy mm. and got bullied a lot in school, which psychologically leapt onto my bodybuilding and fighting career, if it, if it was called that. So yeah, it's, you know, God bless mom and dad. I have one sister, one brother younger than me. And I just knew that Growing up on, on what we call over here the projects, and what these, if anybody from England's listening, it's the council estates where the government pay for their housing. I don't know what it was, Brian, but I just knew all along that I wasn't meant for that life because I'm supposed to leave school, never go to college. Nobody in our family has ever been to college and get a, a job with the gas company digging roads so they could lay the big pipes in the road like my dad, have a couple of children have a beer on Friday and Saturday night and, and grow up in a council estate and projects. And that was my lot because everybody else in my heritage and going back three generations, that's what they've done. I don't think anybody owned a house in my immediate family. Was there any kind of spiritual heritage or background growing up that you experienced? No, there wasn't. There really wasn't. However, and I'll tell you why, Brian, because I want to be real open on this show. I went to a school where they used to have a church with a choir, a full choir, and I was actually the head choir boy. But what happened with all that attention is I got molested by the, the, the choir master, who was also the headmaster of the school next door. Oh. So I kind of turned my back on any religious beliefs. So yeah, and definitely not through the family, and nobody in my family ever went to church, maybe on a Christmas day or something, but too busy getting drunk, a lot of alcoholism in my family. And, and that's the way we grew up. You know, it was, my, my life was all set. This is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to grow up. And, you know, you'll probably live next door to mom and dad and, and struggle and live paycheck to paycheck. And I just know. Now, looking back, I know what he was. God was looking after me. I had bigger plans. But the suffering, Brian, that I had to do to get where I was today was horrendous. What happened with respect to your mindset where you pursued something completely different than your family lineage by getting your doctorate. I think I've always been an overachiever in some areas, but I remember being about 12, 13, stood outside this hotel in Manchester somewhere. This taxi driver pulled up and this guy came out in this suit. He had a briefcase because they were the things at the time. And he got in his taxi and I knew where he was going because all the guys coming out in business suits went to the airport. And I remember thinking to myself, one day, I want to walk out of a hotel with a nice suit on a nice watch, get into a taxi and just say the airport without even worrying about the money. So my mindset kind of changed there. I remember at school, there was a father who, who started a five-a-side football or soccer tournament. So he, my, my friend would say to me, hey, my dad's picking us up tonight for football. Can I have your address? Well, 
I gave him the address about a mile away with these mortgage houses or what we call the posh estates. Mm. And I used to run there and st- stand outside this nice house as they picked me up and they would drop me off and I would wait outside that gate, petrified that they would stay until I went and knocked on the door. Luckily, they didn't. And then I'd run back sometimes in the rain back to our house, which was on the council estate. So there was something embedded there that told me that I wanted better. And I I wouldn't change my upbringing for the world, but I just knew that there was something out there better. And I had no idea at the time exactly what that was. Obviously, I'm just a kid. I'm an alcoholic. So am I, I don't know whether you know how the alcoholic brain works, but we're all or nothing, guys. We're either going to do it or we don't. So every time I put my mind to something, I achieved it at a very early age. Like going on the stage at the age of nine, that's ridiculous. But I was there doing it. And I've, I've pushed them boundaries of what I was meant to be because what have I got to lose? Mm-hmm. And every time I push it, God goes, boom, there you go. What's next? And as long as you work with his kids on a daily basis, we're going to keep giving you this stuff, Rob, and you're going to keep growing and we're going to take you to places you've never been before. And that's kind of the mindset that I had at an early age. So after high school, then you had a choice to make, and it sounds as if you decided you're going to get a high-level degree. Is that what happened? Yes, I wanted to go to college. And I was always interested in the way the mind worked. There's also mental illness in my family. And I was intrigued by that. So in the backstory here going on, I was a session musician in a small studio called Strawberry Studios that was owned by a band called 10CC. They had a great hit over here called I'm Not In Love. So I went there, played a session for them, got three times as much as I was when playing in the band, which was like a full night of travel and playing, but eventually got a job at Abbey Road Studios. So I played with Elton John, Queen, David Bowie, done sessions with all them guys. Wow. Started to get paid a fortune. So I put myself through the first college, second college, and eventually... And again, you've got to realize how the alcoholic mind works because I, at an early age, about 15, had a friend whose father was a Freemason. And because I'm a musician, they was looking for an organist for years and years, but, you know, they're all quite old in that lodge. So he got me to go there. Now, you can't just walk into a Freemason's lodge and start playing organ. You've got to be sworn in. So, you know, I was one position for a few days. Then they swore me in and I was playing the organ. So through them connections at that Freemason's lodge, I got into Oxford University. When you got into Oxford, did you have a sense of direction on your education? Well, not only did I not have, but I knew I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to change the world. I lasted about three months in medical school and he threw me out and I got into the PhD program. But not only did I not really know the direction, I also had this big imposter syndrome going on that I shouldn't really be here. And that's that's been with me most of my life. So, yeah. You know, what's interesting as you share this is you're playing with Elton John and the likes of Elton John, but you've got an imposter syndrome when it comes to school. Yes. Well, most of my life, to be honest, Brian. I just had these brief feelings that I I shouldn't be here if they only knew that I came from the project, Mm. if they only knew that I grew up poor and I'm rubbing shoulders with these guys. And I don't think I've ever got used to that because I was always in the background playing. I was never on stage with, you know, big bands. I was always, you know, the bass player had gone missing or wasted or drugged in rehab and I'd go in and I'd, I'd, I'd play a few songs and get handsomely paid and walk out. So yeah, I keep loitering on that edge of not really leaning into what I was doing because we don't know at the time. A, a couple of years ago, my father passed away. It was me and my friend was in the house collecting and throwing stuff out. And he came across this old black and white photograph of me and him when we were 15 and 16. Now, we were into bodybuilding and we looked at this photograph, black and white photograph, and my friend, oh my, look how amazing we looked. And I'm like, yeah, look at how handsome and you look at our waists are so small. Those were the days, man. And I froze right there. And I thought to myself, those were the days, but we didn't know at the time that those were the days. Yeah. But what if today's one of those days? Mm-hmm. And that's when everything changed around for me, only in the last four years or so, where I realized that every day can be that day. I'd like to dig into that thought change. Once you had that epiphany of any day can be one of those days, what shifted inside? Belief. Belief in a, in a higher power. Mm-hmm. I got that connection with a higher power when I was on the streets when it, the huge miracle and spiritual awakening happened to me, the desperate, most derelict, most isolated place 
in Manchester, it happened right there to me. So I, I knew that I was destined for bigger things. So I had a confidence and I come away from my frustration and my anger and, and just everything by saying, God's got it. That's all I kept saying, God's got it, because he either is or he isn't. You're either pregnant or you're not. There's no halfway with God. You can't be all preaching God stuff and Jesus in the church and then sleeping with his secretary. It doesn't work like that. Talking the talk is easy. I have millions of followers all over the world, national TV programs that, that attract 8 million people. But can I walk the walk? Well, let's circle back to that experience. You finished school. You got your PhD. Yes. What happened after that? I joined the police force. I didn't last too long because I was drunk every day, so they fired me. I then joined a very low-income job, all based on commission, and then decided after six months of being there that I could do this. So I set up a telecommunications company way before the mobile phones, and we built towers for the Army and Navy. So that's where I started to earn some money, but also that's where my uh, drinking started. So a few years of horrendous things, unfortunately, and I'm going to be blatant at it, guys, so be prepared for this. I came downstairs at two or three o'clock in the morning looking for vodka. I finally found some. My wife had followed me downstairs secretly. We had two little babies, age one and three at the time. And as she came down, she snatched a bottle of vodka as I was turning around to get a crystal glass because, hey, I'm not drinking from the bottle. I'm not an alcoholic, so let's get this 25-pound crystal glass to make me feel better about it. And she snatched it and she said, I think you've had enough. Now, logically, I've been drunk for two or three months. You know, maybe it was time. What I should have done, he said, thank you, Mrs. Kelly, gone back up to bed and slept until seven when I usually get up. What I did was took a kitchen knife out and stabbed her three times mm. in my alcoholic blackout. So there were two and fro's from there. I fled to Spain because I knew I was going to get arrested for attempted murder, but everything was okay. The wounds wasn't that bad as she came out. So I came back home and she had her bags packed and uh, she took the children. And I always remember saying to me, Brian, I will love you to the day I die, but you're not going to kill our children because I'd fell down on top of them, drunk. I'd... So after a couple of hours, I got hold of my attorney. I directed him aggressively to get my children back. So he went to court the next morning and he brought my children back. This is where it, it all starts to go wrong for me. I took the children in. I put them in front of the TV. I went to the kitchen and a thought crossed my mind. Wouldn't it be great just to have a beer to celebrate my children coming back? Three days later, when the police kicked the door down and dad's been in a stupor and the children have been changed diapers or fed, mm. I nearly killed them children. They took them off. And my girl at the age of three at the time, never to this day seen my youngest child since. And that was 30 odd years ago. But my eldest said three things as she walked down the path holding mommy's hand. She says, Daddy, Daddy, please stop drinking. Uh, please, please don't go. And then further on down the path, she says, Daddy, Daddy, please get better. And I'm crying. One of the police officers crying. The special service is there. The childhood services were there. My mother-in-law, my wife was there. And when they got to the gate, they opened the gate for her and she turned around one more time and says, Daddy, Daddy, please, please stop drinking. And I, and I couldn't do it. Mm. I, I couldn't do it. So... A few months after that, the, the wife had gone, the children had gone, the houses had gone, the cars had gone, the holiday home had gone. I'd lost my license to practice in the UK and I found myself homeless. Wow. I was abandoned on the streets of Manchester. So I stayed there for 14 months and I did some bad stuff on the streets to survive. This is where it gets weird. I was walking down the back end of Manchester, factories and offices, no human being, no houses, two or three o'clock in the morning. And I dropped down to my hands and knees. It was pouring down wasn't crying because I'd lost my children or my money or my wife. I was sobbing with belly ache because the first time in my life I realized I couldn't stop drinking. And that was after seven attempted suicides. And on two occasions it worked. I was actually dead and they brought me back on the side of a stinky, horrible, wet curbside in Manchester. And I looked up to the sky, Brian, and I said, if there's a God up there, I can't do this on my own anymore. 30 seconds later, a guy walked past me. I first thought is, where did he come from? And he said, hey, my name's Derek. Do you need help? And I told him, and he's an alcoholic in recovery, and he took me back to his house. And he said, you can stay here for as long as you like, Rob, but you've got to come to these 12-step meetings, AA meetings with me. So I went, and I hated them meeting because everybody was bragging and war stories. And halfway around the room, this guy said, my name's John, I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I was like, what did he just say? And he talked about God, and he talked about this book they have in there, the blue book, the big book. And after he, he, he finished, I went over to him and I said, John, my name's Rob, will you sponsor me? And he said, no. 
just before the world opened up and swallowed me, because that was a big thing for me, he said, I'll be a spiritual advisor for 12 weeks. So every Wednesday, I left my house at six, got there for seven, stayed with him till eight, left, got home at nine, because I had to walk. I didn't have any vehicles or bus passes at the time. I went there for 12 weeks, and he taught me some stuff, and he told me that I'd been picked out, talked about God being choosing me, and I thought it was a load of trash. He told me that my world will change after the last day of the 12 weeks. The next day I went home, Derek come home and said, hey, the cleaner's just packed his job in. Do you want a part-time cleaner's job? I said, yes. Later that week, it turned into a full-time job. Somebody gave me a, a car to get to work and back. So when I first got my paycheck, which was cash stapled to an envelope back in those days, I went to the gas station. I bought John a little teddy bear, like literally four inches high, if that, and a card. And I wrote in the card, thank you, John, for introducing me to God as he took the compulsion to drink away. So when I did the walk back there, knocked on his door, there was no answer. In fact, it looked pretty derelict, the house. And the right-hand woman opened the door and she said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, can you tell me where John's relocated to? And she said, there's been no in that apartment for the three or four months I've been here. <laughs> so I let her close the door because I thought she was crazy, must be drunk or something. And I knocked on the other side and this guy came to the door and he looked quite sober and intelligent. And I said, can you tell me where John's relocated to? And he said, John, I said, yeah, the guy next door. Now, this time I'm getting angry. And he said, there's been no one there for 12 months. You can't go in that apartment. It's derelict. There's no flooring in it. I don't know what you're talking about. You've got the wrong address. So I went back to the meeting the day after. And I said to the chairman, do you remember me about 13, 14 weeks ago? And he said, yeah. And that was it, Rob. I said, yeah, Rob, yeah, that was me. Can you tell me if John comes here? And they said, John. I said, yeah, the guy that spoke about God and everything. I was over near the coffee machine speaking to him. And he said, and I quote, Rob, you was over the coffee machine talking to yourself. Oh. Never found that man. In fact, when I started to get a little wealthy, I put a private detective, not one, to find <laughs> him. And nobody could trace him. And that's where my life changed. Rob, let me ask, with respect to his location where he lived, did you actually go to his place during this 12-week period at all? Every Wednesday night, that's where the meeting was in his apartment. So it was at his apartment? Yes, and I went in and we sat together and, you know, we had some good times. And the last night was there after 12 weeks of walking there. He said, your life's going to change from tomorrow. You Be careful. He's going to take you to a different country. And so he did because weeks later, I was on a Christian chat thing on, online. And this was early internet days. And I met a girl in a church and they wanted a speaker and somebody to work with a youth ministry on alcohol and drugs. So they literally brought me over for two weeks. That was 15 years ago. I've never been back in the UK to live. So that's what brought you to the United States was that invitation to speak. Yes. And if you want to add some more to that, a week before or something, I got my passport out and it had been expired by about a couple of days. I was horrified. So I went straight over to the passport, which was like a 45 to an hour bus drive. I went and I gave my passport with all my stuff. And I said, I need it expedited, man, because I'm going away in like seven days time. And he said, oh, well, it's usually a six-month wait, and if you expedite, it might be here between two and three months. So I paid for it anyway. I came home, and I cried myself. I thought, this is not going to happen, and I was so scared to call the church and go, I can't do it. So I was going to do it the last day and make up some story that I'd missed a plane because I was so embarrassed. Four days later, there was a knock on the door. There was the postman there, and he handed me my passport. <laughs> so I knew there was something weird going on. Yeah, so yeah that's how I became, came up. But as soon as I stood off the plane, I had this feeling that I was never going to go back. Interesting. You know, obviously, as you're sharing this, all I can think about is John was an angel sent by the Lord. Now, I denied that for so long because I was embarrassed. And I, in a dream, God said to me, do not be embarrassed. You're either on board or you're not. So I started to tell that story. What he taught me is what I teach today. Part psychology, part behavioral science with alcoholics and addicts and childhood trauma. And then most of what John, John taught me. So I knew what I have, nobody in the world does. Nobody in the world can do what I do because I have this gift that was given to me that when I look back was always meant to be. So yes, definitely John was an angel and, and we could never trace him and it was just phenomenal. During that time of you being taught by John, what springs to mind as one of the top two or three things that were takeaways that now you use every day with your clients? You have to realize that in my industry of addiction, the average treatment center has a three to five percent success rate. 
Now, there's a few out there that I love and I work with right now that are up there, 60 and 70. Mm -hmm. We have a, we like to say 97%, but let's get rid of the people that walked away and don't want it. We have a 100% success rate because he told me, and this is the one that freaked me out and I was scared for a long time. He told me to tell clients and people, 12-step meetings, people I sponsor, guarantee they can recover. Wow. And that was unheard of because there's no cure for alcoholism. So, you know, I just carried on and carried on and the people I work with started to get well because I guaranteed them. Now, when I look at the psychology, even the psychology behind that, if you tell somebody enough times that they're going to believe it, psychology 101. So that's what I did. And I'm out of just over 8,000 people right now that I've worked with in the last 32 years, maybe. And all of them that I know of that hasn't walked away, uh, has recovered and they've got, and they get, and they got the life back and the children back and, you know, the wife back and all that great stuff. Incredible. What have you found to be the linchpin here that separates the three to six percent or three to five percent success versus a hundred percent virtually with you? Well, people want to concentrate on the alcohol, you know, alcohol has one percent to do with alcoholism and the same with drugs. It's just a symptom. It's not the problem. Mm. So first of all, you need a spiritual connection. Now, it has to be God. It can't be a doorknob. It can't be a light. can't be a tree. can't be your best friend. If you do not have a connection with God, you will not fully recover from alcoholism. It's not possible because when a couple of things happen, spiritual awakening, connection with God, and a psychic change, it changes the way you think, your DNA changes. And we found out that and people are freaked out because you have that connection. We call it standing in the sunlight of the spirit. You're either in all your own. Simple. So let's talk about you're either in or out. That seems to be a theme here over and over in your life personally, as well as what you're doing with recovery. When you sit down with a potential client that wants to be free from alcoholism, for example, do you have that kind of an upfront discussion? Oh, yeah. Tell me what that sounds like if I was sitting in front of you. First of all, you have to pass an assessment. Can you get a connection with God in the assessment? This is the conversation. I don't care if you do this program or not. In actual fact, we only take on between four and six patients. So it's up to you. If you can't get connection with God, then get out my office. You don't deserve to be here. If you can't follow direction to the T, get out my office. You don't belong here. Are you in or are you out? Most people say they're in. Some people who waver, we, we escort them to the door mm. and thank them for coming. And if they're real alcoholics, we'll give them $50, you know, but thank you. Don't come back. Now that sounds harsh, mm -hmm. but when they are ready, they can seek treatment elsewhere. But I usually have a two to three month backlog of patients waiting to come to us because we're, we're so minimal with patients because we need to spend a hundred percent time with our guys we're working with to get that connection. So that's how it goes. I mean, sometimes if they're rough and ready or, or they threaten to, especially parents, if you don't take him on, you know, we'll never forgive you. And, you know, I have to say, get out the office because I haven't got time to waste with you. There are millions of people dying on the streets from alcoholism and addiction and childhood trauma, much more than is reported. So much more than is reported. It's the biggest killer in the world, alcohol and drugs, but it's never reported like that. If you are an alcoholic, that the hospital knows you're an alcoholic because you've been there 20 times before and your liver's given in and everything like that, cirrhosis, and you have a car crash, because you're so drunk and you, and you kill yourself, it's put down as car accident. It's not put down as alcoholic. It's not put down as cirrhosis of the liver. It's put down as car accident. Why? Because the pharmaceutical companies and the alcohol beverage companies run this country. You know, as I'm thinking of the way you approach your clients, you're either in or you're out. I'm just thinking in terms of life itself, all of our decisions are in that space. You're either in or you're out. And we waffle for years, yeah. sometimes a lifetime, don't we, in making choices? We do. Yeah, definitely. People are horrible at making choices. People stay in relationships too long. You know, people stay in the same job because they're fearful of not finding another job. You know, it's all this fear. I'm 61. If you get to 65, 70, and you've lived a miserable life, you're to blame. You're to blame. But people don't do that. Like you said, Brian, people stay where they are because they like the comfort zone. What have you found over the years to be the most effective way to get somebody off high center and make a decision, make a choice? I, t I talked to them about a, a story. It's called a girl in the box. I tell people, 
There's a girl in Manchester back in the late 60s, 70s, and she was snatched off the side of the street, young 16-year-old girl, and there was a manhunt, and they couldn't find her. So they withdrew lots of officers because they didn't have time anymore. Nine months later, a police officer in a car is following a van or a car, and he had a broken signal indicator light. So he pulled him over. Now, this is back in the 60s, 70s. The easiest way to find out, because there's no you know, computers back then, is I was in a police force for a short while, mm -hmm. is you ask them what's in the trunk. And if they say, well, a pair of boots, a blue coat, and, you know, a basketball balls, and they open the trunk and that's there, then they let you go. Oh, go on your way, sir, sorry. But they checked his trunk and they found out that there was a stolen screwdriver. That's all it was. Still had the tag on it, couldn't show a receipt. Mm. Went back to the house, let's see what he's got there. And sure enough, there was lawnmowers, there was drills, a bunch of stuff that he'd stolen. But just before they left, one of the police officers saw a box in the corner. It was four foot high by 12 foot wide. And he said, what's in there? And he got all coy. I have no idea. I don't know what's in there. So they smashed the lock off. And when they opened the big box, they found the girl in there that had been snatched nine months before. Oh, no. She'd been beaten out. She'd been abused every day, fed restroom and back in for nine months, Brian, nine months. Wow. So the police officer leant over. She was alive. She was bruised and battered. And he took their hand and the girl looked up to her with like these eyes that were desperate, these eyes that shown abuse, helped her get out of the four foot by 12 box. She took a police coat off and she put it around the girl. What's the first thing, guys, she did? She got back in the box because that's all she's known. That's how the mind works. And we tend to do that. So are you going to smash the box and come with me? Or are you going to get back in? Because if you get back in it with all that pain, abuse and everything else you're torturing yourself with, you're going to die an old and unhappy guy, if not before that, from alcohol and drugs. So I often tell that story. I tell her about my story. I tell her life's amazing. I tell her if, if you follow direction, you will live a life beyond your wildest dreams. God will make sure of that. You'll have that job. You'll earn that money. You'll get that wife, girlfriend, house, car, whatever you need. As long as you follow direction and work with other people, God, it gives us stuff. God wants us to give us so much stuff and we ask so little. You see, there lies the problem because we dare to, to dream and, and our childhood and learn behavior from our parents. So to emphasize that, we got a huge mason drawer and we bought a thousand fleas from the pet store. They had to order them. And we put these fleas into this mason jar and we put the cap on and we stabbed holes in the top and we left them there for about three days. Now, fleas can jump three or four feet. We took the cap off. And here's the interesting part. Not one flea in that jar jumped higher than where the cap was, learned behavior. But what was more interesting is the babies they had inside that jar never jumped higher than where the lid was. And they'd never even seen the lid. And that's what we get. Enmeshment, learned behavior, psyche to say you can't go higher than this. Stop putting the brakes on your imagination. All dreams are is vision of God planted in your brain what your future looks like. But we get it next morning and all them dreams that we ever dreamed of are kicked out of us by our family and friends. Mm. Don't be stupid. You can't do that. How many times have I told you, Robert, you can't go to college because you know it's too stupid? Yeah, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How does one overcome that gravitational pull that keeps us in that box? It's breaking that learned behavior. It's breaking that childhood trauma. We have to go back and we unpick that trauma because to some people, love is tied with fear, is tied with anger, is tied with joy. You know, we have to pick them apart through our NLP, neuro linguistic programming and psychology, and we do brain spotting. We have to go into places where people haven't been before. The eyes are, are part of the brain. It's not the eyes and the optical nerve in the brain. It's actually part of the brain. So if brain spotting takes you through the pupil into the subconscious brain and pulls that stuff out that's stopping you going forward. If you believe God is or he isn't, and you get that spiritual connection, you know you're going to be taken care of. So when we explain this to people, they have a glimmer of hope. And I get always excited about the stuff after 30 odd years of doing this. I'm like the first patient when they come in. I'm so excited. I'm on top. I tell them my story. Homelessness to hear. You have to understand it's humanly impossible. Mm -hmm. You have to have God's help. Again, are you in or out? And most people are excited when they start. They know. And if they're excited, they're halfway there. Yeah. So we smash that box up psychologically. And they're led to a different place. How can people find out more about you? Well, obviously, Dr. Rob Kelly, uh, on any search engine, all the stuff will come up, all the stuff I've done. I spell my name with two Bs, okay? R-O-B-B-K-E-L-L-Y.com is the website. Jump on there, lots of stuff. 
But listen, if you're sat at home listening to this, and I'm sure one or two are, and you're either suffering from childhood trauma or you're suffering from some kind of addiction, and you're sat in that one-bedroom apartment and you're sat on the floor and you're scared stiff and you don't know what to do, you never feel good enough, you never feel wanted, I want to apologize to you because somebody's put that there. Babies are born with million-dollar minds. Why do you keep hanging around 10-cent minds? Mm. There is a way out until this, this is powerful. If you're in that position and you want to talk to somebody, because dialogue's the key here, you call me on my personal cell phone number of 214-600-0210. Call it. Don't get on the internet and Google me. Call it. Call it. I'll give you a 10-minute pep talk that will change your life. And you know, if it doesn't, I'm going to send you $100 for your time. It's never going to cost you. I'm going to send you $100 because I would rather give you a 10-minute pep talk than hear of your funeral in a couple of weeks' time. There is a way out. God's waiting for you to take you by the hand. It's powerful. Don't look at some of these people that, oh, he's all godly him. Look at him. No, it's the most powerful thing that ever happened. And if you are suffering from addiction, this is an affliction. This is a superpower. My time on the streets was like a semester at Harvard because our past becomes our greatest asset as we move forward. Mm. And there's lots of room, guys, on this broad way, this broad highway. There's lots of room. Come join us. As we finish, Dr. Rob, I'd love to have you pray for our listeners, please. Dear Father, make this reach out, Father, to the people listening and beyond. If they're struggling, if they need guidance, if they don't have the relationship with you, that's all you crave, Father. We know that. May you guide and protect the people listening. May you direct their attention to what you would have them be. Let's have some quiet time in the future, guys, where where Jesus can reach down and direct you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob. So great having you on the program. Thank you so much for doing what you do. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.